So what we're going to do today is, uh, uh, is uh, Fermi's golden rule. So last time we talked about decay rates, um, and so we introduced for sort of a, a process where we've got one going to two plus three, we introduced this uh, parameter gamma that uh, gives us a, a measurement of the decay rate. And then for processes where we have one plus two going to two, uh, sorry, three plus four, so a sort of a two body scattering, of course you can have more than just two. I mean, you can have four, five, six here, and the same here, you can have more particles. Um, we talked about a uh, cross section and also a differential cross section that was the uh, sort of fraction of the total cross section that would scatter into a particular, uh, you know, per, per unit solid angle scattering, uh, which we used for, um, you know, things like uh, uh, Rutherford scattering here, where you're sort of scattering into some small uh, solid angle um, at some scattering angle. Uh, uh, theta, and so you could use this uh, differential cross section to calculate the rate of particles you'd expect to see in a detector sitting here as a function of the incident flux of particles. Now, what we did that time was classical, generally speaking, right? This is a, a classical calculation where you're using a Coulomb uh, potential to calculate the uh, relationship between the uh, impact parameter and the scattering angle, right? So that's classical physics. But we at least introduced these sort of concepts. Now, what we're going to do today is these type of calculations, given uh, a, a quantum uh, regime, and what we're going to do, because th these are the sort of quantities that we actually measure in particle physics, is scattering rates, cross sections, uh, and, and decay rates. And so what we're going to do is we're going to split this calculation into two parts because it's dependent on two things. So if you remember when we did the Rutherford scattering here, um, what we ended up with was uh, this dependence on the impact parameter B had a relationship with the scattering angle theta. And this relationship between B and theta is where the physics input came, the, the dynamics of the situation, uh, the dynamics of the, uh, of the problem uh, entered because we used a Coulomb law to relate this impact parameter to um, scattering angle. So what we're going to do is we're going to split the problem into two parts. The first part is the matrix element, which is the amplitude, if you like, of the process. In, this is, of course, in quantum mechanical terms. This is the equivalent of the relationship between impact parameter and scattering angle in classical uh, uh, scattering terms. And this is going to depend on the type of physics that's going on. So is it a weak interaction, strong interaction? What are the properties of the particles involved? And so on. And it's also going to vary depending on the different process that's involved. Right? This is going to be related to the Feynman diagrams that we drew uh, um, in the earlier part of the course. And so we're going to relate each Feynman diagram to a particular amplitude for, or a matrix element uh, for a process. So this is not what we're going to do this lecture. The second part of the calculation here is figuring out that once we know this matrix element, how can we use that to actually calculate a decay rate or a scattering cross-section? And that is going to depend on the kinematics that sort of lies underneath the, the problem. So this is really sort of the dynamics of the problem where the physics come, where the, where the sort of the interaction physics comes in. This here is just basically kinematics, right? Um, so this is the calculation we're going to do uh, uh, today. Uh, and then uh, on Thursday, we'll start working, worrying about matrix elements with a sort of a toy theory uh, to keep things as simple as possible before we leap into the real world with real particles, which you know, just add an extra layer of complication on. So we're, we'll do the simple calculations uh, in the next lecture. But this lecture, we're going to concentrate on this. So these two things here are related by what's called Fermi's golden rule. And this is a, a result of relativistic quantum field theory. Um, so we are not going to go through the derivation of the formulas. We're going to start with a formula, uh, which I will quote to you. But I will explain why that makes sense. 
right? So we're not, because going through the derivations of that things, that would be um, you know, mathematically challenging and, and we're sort of leaping ahead uh, and having to do relativistic quantum mechanics. And uh, that's not going to be easy. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'll give you the formulas, the initial sort of formulas, and say where all the terms come from. And then we'll use them to calculate uh, uh, decay rates and scattering cross-sections for particular uh, common situations. OK, so first thing we're going to consider is decays, right? because that's the simplest thing to consider. So we've got one particle decaying to two or more particles. right? You can't have one particle decay to another particle, uh, do only one particle. Right? It's always got to be two or more. Um, so we've got a decay process like this. right? So we've got one particle decaying to two, three, four, all the way up to n. So the decay rate that we get for this process from quantum field theory is given by this. So gamma is our uh, uh, decay rate. And then we have this factor s over 2 h bar m1, where the indices here refer to the number of the particles. So m1 is the mass of the uh, particle that's decaying. And then we have an integral over, and then here we have a sort of a, uh, here's why, this is why curly m squared. So this is our matrix element squared. This is the amplitude for the diagram that we're not going to worry about. You'll see this just sort of appear in the formulas, and we'll talk about how we calculate this in, in future lectures. But for now, we're just going to stick it in there. And then we have 2 pi to the fourth, uh, delta to the fourth, and then p1 minus P2 minus dot, 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 minus Pn, where these are the four vectors, right? This is why it's delta to the fourth. What this notation means is that we've got one, it's, it's four delta functions multiplied together. The first one is P10 minus P20 minus P30 and so on. And the second one is P11, P12, so the, the x component, then the y component, then the z component, right? So these are the one delta function for each component. That's what I'm meaning here by uh, this notation. And then we multiply this by a product of j equals 2 to n. So in other words, I'm going over the decay product particles now, not the initial particle. So multiplication over the decay particles of 2 pi uh, delta pj squared. So this is the four vector minus mj. And I'll explain these terms in a minute once I've got them written down. OK, so this is where these terms come from. So this here is a um, a, a degeneracy term, if you like. So uh, this S factor here is equal to um, 1 over N. Uh, maybe I better not call it N. That will get confusing. Right? So where these numbers here are the number of identical particles, right? So this is effectively a term that um, counts for degeneracy because, of course, we're talking quantum mechanical systems here. So if, say, for example, I have a decay of a pi zero going to gamma gamma, right? There's a two identical particles in the final state, and there's no way for me to determine which is which, right? So there's a degeneracy there. So in this factor, I've got one group of two identical particles. So I have one over two factorial here. Right? If I have a decay, um, well, let's do the pi zero again, going to e plus, e minus, e plus, e minus. So it's doing a double Dalek's decay. Then at this point, I've got two positrons, which are identical, and two electrons, which are identical. So I've got two groups, and each group has two identical particles, 
So I'd have 1 over 2 factorial times 1 over 2 factorial for this degeneracy factor, right? So for each group of identical particles, um, you have a 1 over the number of particles in that group factorial, right? So if, if I had, yeah, I can think I can still, yeah. So if I had a really bizarre decay that looks something like this, right, then I'd have 1 over 3 factorial times 1 over 3 factorial um, in the decay for this S factor. Right? And if I have three groups, I'll have another factor in there and so on. Right? So this, this is to account for degeneracy, this S factor. Uh, well, that's just the mass of the decaying particle. Um, this here is the matrix element, which comes from the dynamics. We'll worry about that later. We just put it in here. Um, but you should know that it's a scalar quantity. Right? This, this thing we get out here is going to be a, a scalar quantity, and that'll become important in a minute. Now, this delta function here, if you remember, we did direct delta functions at the start of the course, and this was the reason, because when we integrate over a delta function, we get the value of the integrand at the point where this delta function evaluates to zero. So if we look at the contents of this delta function, it's the initial four momentum of the particle minus the sum of all the four momenta of the decay products. So this is going to give you zero when the initial four momenta is equal to the sum of all the refined, you know, decay product four momenta. So this delta function here is effectively, all it's doing is just giving us conservation of energy. All right? So this is just our statement of conservation um, of energy and momentum. I'll call it three momentum. Right? So this delta function here is just conservation of energy uh, and momentum doesn't do anything else, right? Because what we're doing here is we're going to integrate over all possible uh, momenta, right? So if we're integrating over all momenta without any constraint, we'd end up with you know, particular values of energy and momentum that would be uh, uh, not conserve um, uh, energy and momentum. So we stick this in here, so we're only going to select out the points where we have conservation of energy and momentum. So this here is where we put in the information about the decay products, right? So we're summing over all possible combinations, right? So any value of momentum for the uh, final decay products, and then we're constraining it by delta function. So this gives, us, this gives us our constraint for overall conservation of energy and momentum. This guy, gives us our overall constraint uh, of relativity. So this is the relativistic mass energy momentum. Now, the reason we have to put this in is because we're dealing with quantum mechanics. Now, although we haven't done relativistic quantum mechanics, that, that'll come next week. Um, although we haven't done relativistic quantum mechanics, what we ha the, the reason we have to put this constraint in here is because while in classical, well, not classical relativistic, that doesn't sound right, but, but non-quantum relativistic mechanics, you know, the energy mass momentum relationship is always true, right? Just like in normal Newtonian mechanics, the normal, you know, P is equal to MV, and so therefore you get um, the relationship E is equal to P squared over 2M is always true for all classical mechanical particles. But once you go into the uh, uh, realm of Schrodinger, this is no longer true, right? That, that for short periods of time, you get uncertainties in the energy and the momentum. And so this relationship is no longer guaranteed to hold in uh, all cases. We got a bin because this thing doesn't work. Right? So just as this doesn't always hold for in, in regular quantum mechanics, what we find out in, in classic, in, in um, quantum, uh, uh, relativ relativistic quantum mechanics, this relationship does not always hold, right? Because there's, of course, uncertainties in the energy and the momentum, and so you're not always guaranteed to have what we call a particle on mass shell, right? Now, that's fine if we're talking about a particle that's in the middle of a diagram that only lives for a very short period of time, right? That's not a problem. But if we're talking about one of the decay products, 
right? So we've got our pi on decaying to two gammas. We'd better make sure that we always end up with something that has, uh, you know, the, the energy for a gamma should always be equal to p times c, right? Because it's a real photon we're seeing, it's not a virtual photon. So a virtual photon can effectively have a mass that's allowed in quantum mechanics because it only exists for a short period of time, and so there's some uncertainty on its energy and its momentum, and since you know, there's some uncertainty on the energy and the momentum, that effectively means that a, a virtual photon can effectively have a mass. Right? It's called being off mass shell. But if it's a real photon, in which case here it's existing for a huge period of time, the uncertainty on the energy and the momentum here become very, very small, and so therefore you better make sure that this mass goes to zero uh, for a real particle that's coming out of the decay, right? So for real particles that we observe that are, exist for significant periods of time, we have to have it on mass shell. So we have to add, because we're integrating here over all energies and three momentum components, Right? We haven't necessarily got a constraint for each particle, right? because this is the four momentum for each particle. So we haven't necessarily got a constraint for each particle that says that you know, the magnitude of the four momentum squared must be equal to m squared c squared. So, because this integral here uh, you know, is integrating over all possible values of the four different components. So by putting in this delta function here, we constrain our integral to only include the points where this relationship is held, right? So we're integrating over all possible energies and components of three momenta, right? So we're considering every possibility, and then we're putting in this constraint to say, well, because these are real particles, we only want to consider the possibilities which correspond to real, you know, particles following the uh, relativistic energy momentum relationship, yeah. No, they do, but they go in here. <laughs> so so we'll, we'll deal with that. We, we, when, we, when we come to sort of calculating these matrix elements, you'll see when we do the Feynman diagram rules that we don't have these delta functions do not appear. I mean, we still get some delta functions, but we don't get delta functions like this for, for things like propagators, which are essentially the lines that are in the middle of a Feynman diagram because those are virtual particles. And, and in fact, what you find is that you get a, a, it peaks, the contribution peaks when the virtual particle is on its mass shell, but it's not actually, you get a pole, in fact, at that point, um, but you don't exclude it and say, well, I only want to consider particles that are on the mass shell. You allow, uh, you, you, I mean, you essentially do this sort of integral here, but without this delta function, right? But that comes in here, not in the kinematics. Okay, so that's where this comes from. Now, this, of course, is our step function, right? So this is a, a step function that looks something like this. So it's zero here, and then it peaks, and it goes up to one um, above zero. And so what this tells us is that we're disallowing negative energy states for the decay particles, which is a good thing, right? Because this is the zero component of our four momentum for particle J. So this is essentially, and so what this says is this thing together just says that the energy of particle J had better be uh, uh, greater than or equal, well, no, greater than zero, right? So that's all this step function does, is it just says we have to have an energy that's bigger than zero because we don't see many particles with energies less than zero. And then here, we're integrating over all possible energies all possible um, components of momentum. So is everybody happy where all these terms come from? Then they make sense, right? Okay, there's constant factors in there which come out of, of, uh, of uh, quantum field theory, but hopefully you can at least sort of see where the terms are coming from and that they make physical sense. Okay, so next thing we have to do is we want to be able to actually evaluate this nasty looking thing for a real uh, uh, situation. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to attack the delta functions because those are going to allow us to make things simpler. So if we look at this delta function here, 
we can separate it out and we can separate out each, well, we're going to deal with just one of the delta functions, but of course it applies to each of the ones in this product term. Um, so delta of pj uh, squared minus mj squared c squared, we can rewrite that as delta of, and now p um, p zero j minus right. So this is the energy component minus the uh, um, uh, the three momentum component. And there shouldn't be a four here, because that's the scalar, and that's the scalar. So this is the um, energy squared um, minus the spatial part squared, right? So this is just the four vector dot product um, minus mj squared c squared. And if I treat this as this term minus this term, I can uh, uh, factorize that, and what I'm going to end up with is um, so it's one over two times. Um, so what I'm using now is I'm going to use this re re identity here: that delta of x squared minus a squared is one over two a delta of x minus a plus delta of x plus a, right? And that was one of the identities we dealt with very early on, like the first lecture of the course, or maybe the second lecture, right? So all I'm doing is I'm splitting and factorizing this delta function into the sum of two separate delta functions. So if I do this here, what I'm going to end up with is I'm going to end up with... Um, the square root of this here um, on the bottom. Right, because that's my A factor here. Um, and then I end up with uh, uh, two delta functions here. Delta of, well, uh, so what have I got? P zero j minus the square root of pj squared plus mj squared c squared plus and then the delta function of p zero j plus square root right so i've taken my initial delta function I split it up uh, like this by writing out the component, and then I factored it into two separate delta functions. So this one, delta function here, is going to pick out the point where P0j is equal to the square root of this. And this delta function, because remember we're integrating over, um, there's an integral, there's an integral over d0, um, Right? There's an integral from here. Right? One of the components is d p zero j. So when I'm integrating this delta function over it, it's going to pick out the value where p zero p zero j is equal to this square root, and where p zero j is equal to minus this square root. Right? So it'll give me two points. But I have my theta function here, which is zero. So this is equal to 0 if p 0 j is less than 0. And since this term picks out a point Right, since this delta function fixes p0j as minus this square root, it is killed by the delta term, uh, killed by the theta 
theta step function. So this guy here is killed because we're multiplying it by this theta step function. Right? So it gets rid of this term. And so all we're left with is this delta function here. Right? So what I can do now is I can rewrite this term in the equation at the top. These guys here, so this delta function and this theta function, are going to be replaced. And I'll I write the terms I'm simplifying in a different color. So I'm going to simplify this term here. And I'm going to replace it by delta pj0 minus the square root of pj squared okay everybody happy so far yeah okay so if I look at this I'm integrating this term here over p0j, so I can get rid of my energy integral, right? Because all that this is going to do is it's going to fix p0j as equal to uh, uh, this expression here, this square root expression. So once I've done that, I've at least got rid of one of the things I'm integrating over now. I've, I'm, I'm now, instead of getting uh, you know, four integral signs here, I've at least reduced it to three. Um, thanks to, well, in fact, it's four, of course, per decay product, so it's, it's more integrals there than you care to think about. Um, but I've at least now got rid of one integral per decay product because I'm fixing P0j um, in terms of the, uh, the other three components, right, the P0, Pj, uh, three vector uh, squared. So when I do that, this whole term here is, uh, is going to disappear. Um, And what I get now is I've still got a product. Uh, I've still got a product over all the particles, but now this is going to read um, 1 over 2 times the square root of pj squared plus mj squared c squared. So that's the uh, constant term. And now d3pj all over 2 pi cubed, all right? So I simplified this product term of all the particles um, and got rid of the delta function. And getting rid of this delta function has allowed me to reduce the number of integrals by 1. So now I'm only integrating over the uh, uh, spatial components of momentum. And what this also means is that P0j now, everywhere it occurs must be equal to pj squared plus mj squared c squared, right? So, effectively, what's happened is I've got rid of one of the constants of integration, and I've required that all of the decay products exist on their mass shell, right? So, in other words, that the, um, energy, the relativistic energy-momentum relationship holds for all decay products. Any questions so far? No? Hopefully it's, it's pretty straightforward, right? Okay, so that's where we've got to now, but I want to simplify things um, further. So if we now have a look at this delta function here, right, um, what I can do is I can split this up. So we're going to make an assumption now and that is that we're going to, so, so up until this point, everything's been completely generic, right? I've made no assumptions other than, you know, relativity applies, right? 
So the next step now, I'm going to start talking about specific cases. And so now we're going to consider the case where the particle one is at rest when it decays. Right? So we're going, to, we're going to assume that particle one is not moving, it's at rest. We can do this because what we're going to do now is calculate a decay rate in the frame of particle one. But of course, once we've got a decay rate in the frame of particle one, it's trivial to sort of just project it into any frame where it's moving, right? It's, it's not hard to do. We just do a Lorentz boost on the decay products. Um, so we're going to do that, but it's going to simplify things here to consider particle one uh, uh, being at rest. So, so when we do that, what we've got is we're going to look at this guy here, this delta function, so, or the four delta functions, let's not do it in red now. So we've got our delta function here, P, uh, P1 minus P2 minus P3. And we're making, we're going we're gonna to now, well, actually, there's one more assumption I forgot to tell you about. So we're going to assume that 1 is at rest, and we have a two-body decay. Oops. Right, so we're talking particle at rest decaying into particles two and three, right? So we're, we're making simplifying assumptions. But up until this point, everything's generic, right? Now we're applying these two additional assumptions. Particle one is at rest, which really isn't much of an assumption, and that we've only got two decay products, which again, um, if we do it with, with four, we get a more complex formula, but we'll, uh, we're, we're not going to go through the maths uh, for that because it just adds complexity without really adding any more understanding. So when we do this, we can write this out. Remember, this is a product of four delta functions, one for each component. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write out the time component here, which is P10 minus P20 minus P30. And then the spatial components are just going to be minus P2 minus P3 because P1 is 0 because it's at rest. All right. So if I look at this, this guy here is going to set P2 to minus P3. All right. These two guys, are, um, so I can fix the value, or rather, uh, P3 In other words, if I look at this now, if we're considering two particles, I have a D3P2 and a D3P3, right? I've got two terms here. This term here is uh, D3P2 and a D, oops, D3, P3. But I've got these three delta functions, one for each component, is setting P3 to be equal to minus P2. So what that means is I can get rid of this integral term by setting P3 equal to minus P2, right? Because that's what a delta function does. I'm integrating over all possible values of P3, but this delta function here is 0 for any value of P3 that is not equal to minus P2. So effectively, I can just put in the integral here P2, uh, P3 equal to minus P2. Well, since the only place where P3 occurs is going to be in P3 squared, the fact that it's neg negative doesn't make any difference. All right? So again, this is just fixing the value of P3 to be equal to minus P2. And this, of course, should make a lot of sense, because now what we're talking about is a two-body decay. 
where we've got particle two and particle three, and of course, for conservation of momentum, they've got to head off in opposite directions if this guy is at rest uh, when the decay happens. Right? So this makes perfect sense from a classical kinematic point of view. Um, and all it means here is that I can now replace this product term. In fact, I'm now, so I'm replacing the spatial component of that is allowing me to fix these uh, uh, two uh, uh, three-dimensional integrals. And so now what I end up with is I've still got my one delta function left for the energy. Or energy over C, rather. And now I don't have this product term because I'm assuming two particles. So I can um, actually write it out as root P done here. Okay, so I'm, I'm also, well, I'll leave these factors in here at the moment. So I've got 2 pi to the 6 here because I had a 2 pi cubed and a 2 pi cubed. All right, well, we'll deal with cancelling it out in a minute. So this is now what I've got left for these uh, product term over the uh, decay products. P3 is equal to P2. Of course, the mass is not changed. That's why there's an M2 here and an M3, so this is from the two terms in our product series expansion, and I've entirely got rid of three dimensions of the integral because the D3P3 has been killed by this delta function here. So everybody happy with that so far? Yeah? All right, good, okay. So, next step is um, why don't we simplify these things down a little bit? Um, so, we can start cancelling terms here, right? I've got a 2 pi to the fourth here, and so that can cancel and become. Uh, uh, squared, and then I can take that constant and uh, uh, stick it out here at the front, and why am I, oh, yeah, okay, I forgot, there's a, sorry, there's a 4 in here because it uh, was 1 over, I'll skip 4 to show you on there. So there was a 1 over, it was 1 over 2 square root, so when I put my two square roots here, I should have had a two times a two, so I was missing a factor of four on the bottom that comes from this factor of two here, right? So when I'm multiplying out this product series, I would have had a two root this times a two root this. Uh, so I need a factor of four in there. So this now is going to be equal to uh, S over eight times two pi squared h bar m1 uh, integral of curly m squared delta and then uh, multiplied by uh, Okay, so this is what I've got it simplified down to now, right? Just one uh, integral. Okay, so if I look at this guy here, right? 
Remember, we had this constraint that came from the, um, oops. Remember we had this constraint, come on. Yep. We had this constraint that came from this delta function here that P0j was equal to this square root here. So I can replace P02 and P03 with these expressions here, right? Because remember, everywhere in this uh, integrand where P02 and P03 occurs, uh, because we've integrated out over this delta function, it's constrained that uh, P02 and P03 um, are equal to this uh, mass shell uh, uh, constraint. So, This delta function now um, is going to be equal to, and here we get a really beautiful delta function, um, P10, so that's the energy term for the initial particle based on its mass because it's at rest, minus the square root of uh, P2 squared plus M2 squared c squared minus the square root of p2 squared plus m3 squared c squared. Right. So if I make this substitution in to here, then all of these terms here, we'll ignore this guy for the moment, but all of these terms here will depend entirely, oops, that should be P2, depend entirely on P2 squared. So this is a function of P2 squared, right? The magnitude of the momentum of the second particle squared. Now, if I look at this guy here, right? This guy has got to be a scalar, right? It cannot be a vector quantity. The only kinematic vectors that this thing can depend on, right? I mean, it can have internal dependencies of itself, but those have to integrate out because I have to end up with a scalar quantity, right? So since this guy is a scalar, the only kinematical thing that it can depend on is going to be P2 because these delta function constraints, you know, if it depended on P3, the delta function constraint would immediately set that P3 dependency to be equal to minus P2. Right, I mean, in general, in fact, this thing would have a dependence on P3, you know, the momentum of the third decay product, but because we're integrating over it, it's constrained by the delta function, we're only considering values where P3 is equal to minus P2. So this thing can only be a function of P2. So this thing here, the only vector it can really be a function of is P2 in terms of the kinematics. Now, the one thing that it can also be a function of is it could be a function of the spin of the initial particle, right? Um, well, in fact, the spins of, of all the particles because there may be a relationship between S1 and S2. So S1, S2, and S3, right? So this is where we're going to make another simplifying assumption. When we're doing decays, in over, the overwhelming case when we do decays is that we average over all the spins, right? We do not align the spins of the particles. To get particle spins aligned is a really hard thing to do. It's not a simple easy thing, right? If you think about it when we did that, I mean, we talked about the cobalt-60 experiment, which was a case where they got the spins of the uh, nuclei aligned and then studied the decays, right? That wasn't done until the 1960s. So up until that point, nobody had even had ever looked at anything that was a spin depend, what we call a spin dependent cross section. And so overwhelmingly, the types of decays that we look at is where we have particles and we don't care whether they're spin up, spin down, what they are. 
um, we just look at them decaying. And so what we say is because you know, these things were talking decay rates for large number of particles, not individual event decays, we can calculate what we call a spin averaged cross section. So in other words, we don't care what the particular spins of these particles are. We're not looking at them. We're averaging over particles with, you know, particles in the initial state that have any spin. Uh, we don't care what that spin is. We just average over all possible spins. And of course, if you average over all possible spins, then these guys, you know, this matrix element here won't have any dependence on a net spin. So when we do a calculation, um, particularly when we deal with weak interactions of these matrix elements, we may well get an expression that has a dependence on a spin, but most of the time we don't care about that dependence because the dependence is only important if we're looking at particles which have got their spins aligned. And you know, so then, for example, in the weak case, it'll tell you that you get particles forwards and not particles backwards or vice versa. Um, so as long as we don't care about spins and we don't have particular spin states, although there may be a relationship between these three spins, if the initial spin can point in any direction and we average and we don't measure that, we average over all possible spins, then this dependency goes away and we're only left with a dependency on, on P2. So I know that's sort of a, a bit of a hand wavy argument. We can do it better when we actually calculate the uh, uh, spin dependencies for, for matrix elements. But so effectively, as long as we're uh, doing spin averaging, the initial spin doesn't matter, and this thing can only be a function of P2. And since it can't end up being a vector, if the only vector I've got that it can be a function of is P2, then this thing must be a function of P2 squared, because the only way you can convert a vector into a scalar is to take a dot product. Right? And if the only vector you've got to take a dot product with is itself, then this thing has got to end up being a function of P2 squared. I mean, it might be the square root of P2 squared, you know, if you depend on the magnitude of P2, but nevertheless, that's a function of P2 squared. Right? So this guy here, or maybe a better way to say, put it, is this guy can only be a function of the magnitude of P2 because there's no other vector it can have a, uh, a dot product with as long as we do spin averaging, right? As long as we do uh, average over uh, all possible spins. Okay, so if this thing here is a function of P2, we can now, or magnitude of P2, we can now do, uh, uh, um, a, instead of integrating here, where we've got these three components, instead, what we can do is we can go to polar coordinates, and we can swap D3, P2, can go to, um, was it 4 pi rho squared, D rho. Right, effectively, what I'm actually going to here, maybe I should do it here, is I'm going to um, uh, right, that's my volume element. If I'm going from Cartesian coordinates, I'm actually going to uh, a spherical polar coordinates. So in spherical polar coordinates, I've got x, y, and z in Cartesian. I have radius, phi, and theta in spherical polar coordinates. But since everything here is just a function of the magnitude of, uh, 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 of P2, this is equal to rho. So rho is equal to the magnitude of P2. So this thing here is only dependent on rho, and so I can integrate out this uh, uh, sine theta, I can integrate out the phi and the theta, and this gives me a factor of uh, uh, four pi, right? So this four pi comes from this term and then these two terms. <coughs> 
right? I just integrate out over theta and phi because everything is constant uh, with respect to theta and phi, and I've now managed to reduce everything down to only one variable. And so now what I've got is I've got a spherical uh, polar integration where I'm going to have this horrible delta function and then these things in terms of 1 over rho squared. So what I'm going to do, since we're getting, getting a bit slower than I thought, um, so I can substitute in here. So once I do this substitution here, or I replace the magnitude of P2 with rho, what I'm going to end up with here is my matrix element squared, where this, of course, now depends, is a function of just rho. Um, I have this horrible delta function here, and then I have my rho squared um, on the bottom here, and I'm taking my 4 pi out and um, using it to cancel, and I have a factor of, uh, where's my 2 pi squared? So I've got a factor of uh, 4 pi squared here, and I'm multiplying by 4 pi, so I just end up with a factor of 2 pi um, Sorry, I just end up with a factor of pi uh, here because this is 4 pi squared and I'm multiplying it uh, um, 1 over 4 pi squared and I'm multiplying it by 4 pi. So I just end up with a pi here. So I'm going to end up with this expression here. Now, the reason we're going to go a little bit faster here is because uh, uh, you guys are going to do some of this in your uh, assignment. So what I'm going to make now is I'm going to make a substitution and I'm going to say u is equal to this expression here so that I can simplify this delta function, right? And so if I take u and I differentiate it with respect to rho, I'm going to get this expression here, right? So this is just algebra at this point. And I can stick this in here so I can have d rho um, is going to be equal to... Um, d rho by du times du. So what I'm going to do is, since this is my substitution, I'm going to have to put 1 over this, right? So this divided by u times rho in uh, du here. And so this bracket, the, this term here, is going to cancel with this term because I've got this reciprocal here. So this and this cancel. And one of the rows cancel with the row here, so I'm going to end up with row over u. Yeah? Right? Because I've got d row by du, not du by d row. And this makes things really nice and simple, right? So you can see now that we're getting down to something that's a lot simpler. This substitution allows me to make uh, um, things a lot easier. So. Uh, this is just what I was explaining before. So here's our matrix element as a, as a function of rho. So at this point here, this delta function is going to constrain u, our substitution variable, to be equal to m1c. And so if I have this co constraint that u is equal to m1c, then I can calculate what the value of rho is going to be, and it's constrained to be this, and now you're going to calculate that on your assignment. Um, and essentially, this is just the magnitude. Uh, rho here, of course, is just the magnitude of the outgoing decay product momenta, right? Because we have two decay products. Each of them has equal uh, uh, momentum magnitude. And so all we do now is we just stick our value. Um, we, we've got u here as m1c. So we've got, sorry, here we've got um, uh, the matrix element squared. Or maybe this one I'll write out. So what we've got here now is we've got our, our decay rate, and we've got S over 8 pi H1 M1. All right. So what this is, what, what I can do here is this here is going to constrain u to be equal to m1c when I integrate over it, right? So the fact that I'm integrating over u constrains it to be equal to 
M1C, and that constraint here is going to give me a constant uh, uh, here. This guy is, of course, already constrained. We can see here, right, this is what you're going to prove in your assignment. You can see that this row, if u1 is equal to m1c, then rho here just depends on the masses of the uh, initial particle and its decay product. So rho here becomes a constant because of this constraint. Um, so rho is constrained to be constant. And since rho is constrained to be constant, and this is a function of rho, this becomes a constant. And so I can get rid of the integral entirely. Right? It doesn't matter what the actual form of the dynamics in this decay is. It can be any decay. As long as it's a two-body decay of a particle at rest, it doesn't matter what the decay mechanism is. Right? This decay is kinematically constrained. It's not constrained by the dynamics. It's entirely constrained by the kinematics of the process because I can entirely get rid of this integral. And so what I end up with is that the decay rate now becomes s over 8 pi h bar m1. Um, I've got this matrix element squared term here. And then this term becomes simply um, rho, which is the magnitude of the decay product uh, momenta, divided by m1 times c. And so I can just put these two m1s together and get m1 squared times c. And that gives me a decay rate that is, you know, for any two-particle decay, once I know the matrix element squared here, right? Any questions on that? Yeah. Oh, this is just the, if you remember when we're doing, um, so when we're doing this substitution here, when we're switching to spherical polar coordinates, right? Rho here is the magnitude of the outgoing uh, momentum, P2, right? And it's given this constraint here, it's a constant value. Okay, well look, you understand where this constraint comes from on this substitution variable u, right? Comes coming from this delta function, yeah? Right, so given this constraint on u, rho here is a constant, yeah? So you can see that here we get a constant value that comes out, right? So this constant value that comes out, I am arguing, is the magnitude of the decay product momentum. Right, because of the substitution I said here, I said rho was equal to the magnitude of P2, and P2 is equal to minus P3. So if I'm taking magnitudes, rho here is just the magnitude of the momentum of one of the decay products. Right? And it's, so that's not necessarily fixed, right? I mean, because we're integrating over all possible values of P2, but what I'm saying here is that when, you, when we actually integrate this, uh, uh, do this integral here, this delta function constrains it to be a constant, which of course is exactly what you'd expect because if you just think of the kinematics of a two-body decay, you've got some initial mass of the particle, the final mass is a constant, and so therefore you've got a particular release of energy and there's only one way you can split up that energy between the two decay products. Yeah? Yeah. It's, it's the magnitude. And, and the magnitude of P2 is equal to the magnitude of P3. So this, this doesn't tell you what direction they point in, right? They point in any direction, but it's just, this is just the magnitude of their momentum, which is kinematically constrained, right? So, I mean, the, the thing we get from here, right, is that we managed to evaluate this decay rate without leaving any integrals in. We did the integral without knowing what this dynamic, uh, the, the process was, which tells us that the decay is kinematically constrained, because all we're dealing with here are the kinematics, not the actual process, right? This is independent of the matrix element here. So for a two-body decay, all the matrix element is going to control is how fast the thing decays. It can't control where the decay products go for a spin averaged decay rate, right? Obviously, if we have all our particles with some spin alignment, then we can start having um, uh, angular variations. 
Okay, any questions? Good. Okay, so we'll go through this one a bit faster uh, because we're running out of time and I, I, I want to get through these, uh, these phase-based things. And this is almost exactly the same thing that we're doing here, right? It's just repeated a second time. So next thing we're going to consider is we've done decay rates and so now we're going to consider scattering rates, right? Remember we talked about the fact we're never going to have three particles in an initial state. So the only things we ever have to worry about are initial single particles which decay and two particles which collide. So here we've got one plus two going to three plus four plus whatever up to n, right? And we're going to take exactly the same approach that we did with the decay rate. So first of all, we go to quantum field theory and we come up with our formula. So again, we have our degeneracy factor here. This time on the bottom, we have this expression here, which is the dot product of the two initial particle form momenta. So that's the dot product of these two guys form momenta minus m1, m2, c squared squared. Right? So again, this comes out of quantum field theory. We're not going to do the derivation. And then just as we had before, this part is exactly the same. We now integrate our dynamic, our, our matrix element, amplitude squared, and we integrate um, it over all possible form momenta of all the products of the, of the scattering interaction. Right? So these guys um, you know, collide produce other particles, and we're summing over all possible um, form momenta of the products, right? So this was exactly the same factor that we had before, and we have our delta function here to conserve energy and momentum, and of course now because we've got one and two of the initial ones, it's delta of P1 plus P2, and then minus P3, P4, and so on, right? So the sign of P2 is changed because P2 is now in the initial state, not the final state. So this delta function gives us our conservation of energy and momentum. So again, this is exactly what we did over here. We took our, uh, we looked, oops, we looked at the delta function for the decay products, and we factorized this out. So we can factorize out this, this uh, uh, decay, uh, delta function here. And again, we use the same uh, uh, substitute, factorize it into a, a sum of two delta functions. So delta of x squared plus a squared is given by this. So we split it out again. And again, we use this uh, theta function here to get rid of the negative energy uh, solution, right? We only have positive energy solutions kinematically. Um, and so we end up with this, right? So this delta function times the theta function is equal to this expression here where we only have the positive delta function. And then we can put this back into our equation. So this is, other than this factor at the front, nothing here is different than what we did for the decay rate. This is exactly the same, and we end up with exactly the same constraint that the decay products have to be on mass shell, right? Or the interaction products have to be on their mass shell and obey the uh, Einstein energy momentum relationship. So this is as far as we can go, again, just like it was for the decay case, this is as far as we're going to can go with a completely generic example. So I've made no assumptions here other than we've got two particles producing uh, a whole series of particles. So now we're going to simplify things by making some assumptions. So first thing, we can't um, assume that everything's at rest to start with because then these two guys wouldn't collide. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to consider the center of mass frame. What I'm just pointing out here is that there's no constraint. We're not doing a classical thing, right? So this is not two particles bouncing off each other. It's not like two balls bouncing off and you get the same balls back. Um, this is a, a quantum mechanical interaction. Um, you know, this the matrix element here can convert, if these were E plus E minus, these guys could be mu plus mu minus, right? Or pi plus pi minus, or whatever is allowed by the process being considered. These are not the same particles, right? So there's no constraint that the masses have to be the same. So what we're going to do is we're going to consider the center of mass frame so that P1 is equal to minus P2. And if you do that, again, this is on your assignment to prove, um, this expression here becomes, reduces to this, and you'll see that on your assignment. Um, so this is the energy of one plus the energy of two times the magnitude 
as the momentum of the first one divided by c. Of course, the magnitude of p1 is also equal to the magnitude of p2. Right? It's only the directions that are opposite because we're in the center of mass frame. And so we can put this relationship in to our cross-section formula here, and this just deals with the, uh, the factor at the front. So up until this point, really all we have done, except for this little uh, tweak here, it's been exactly the same as the decay rate. Nothing we've done is different than what I did in, in detail on the board um, for the first part. So now we have our total cross-section is equal to this thing, and we have these two, we're assuming a, a, a two-body uh, scattering. So again, we're limiting ourselves to three plus four, and so we have these two integral components coming out here. So this is what's going on. We have P1 and P2 coming in equal and opposite, and then there's our interaction, and P3 and P4 uh, shoot out at some angle theta to the initial direction of P1 and P2, right? So we do have an angle here uh, in the direction. So if I look at the form momentum here, right, and I use these diagrams to actually write down the form momentum in component form, um, and again, this is going to be something you'll be having a look at in your uh, um, assignment, then this product of four form momenta, E1 for each component of the uh, four vectors here, simplifies to this expression here. Right? So I'm just using this diagram, and I'm using the dot product. Well, I'm not actually putting in the dot product here, but P1 and P2 are equal and opposite here, and so I just end up with the energy components. The vector components cancel out. Um, uh, the, sorry, the spatial components cancel out. And so here, um, and, and here I've got the sum, um, the, the three momenta, the only three momenta that are left are going to be P3 and P4 because P1 is equal to minus P2. So the spatial components of these two guys always cancel out because they're equal and opposite. So this simplifies to this, and this delta function here does exactly what happened in our decay. Right? If you remember, in our decay product here, we had P, well, in case it was P2 and P3, and we said that uh, P3 was equal to minus P2. Well, this one just sets P4 equal to minus P3, and we're going to end up with exactly uh, the same thing here. It's, um, we, we just have this constraint here where P3 is minus P4, and so we can substitute everywhere P4 occurs. We just put in minus P3, and then we just integrate over P3. All right, um, and then we've got rid of this delta function. We've integrated over this delta function, gets rid of the integral over P4. And so we're left with this expression here. Okay, so again, this is just the same thing we did with the, with the decay product. We're left with these constraints for the energies of the produced particles, and we can now substitute this in Right, for P3, 0, and P4, 0, just as we did over here with our decay products. The method's identical. Right? That's why I'm skipping over it and going at speed. Um, only now, of course, this function has this thing at the front. Right? It's a different expression at the front here, but it has this same uh, um, expression at the back, only instead of P2, we've got P3, um, and instead of M2, we've got M4. Um, and so now I've got something that looks exactly like what we had before. Um, we've got P2 is minus P1, P3, P4 is minus P3. And so if we look at these, given these constraints, although we have four four momenta, only two of these four momenta are independent, right? Because these are constrained, the other two four momenta in terms of the first two. But, and here's the kicker, right? Because we've now got two independent directions, P1 and P3, right? If you think about it here, we've got this is one direction and this is two directions. This angle comes into play. We cannot get rid of this angle, right? So the matrix element here is going to end up depending on this angle theta, or could. I mean, it, it may not, but we don't know that. Right? Because we have two vectors, P1 and P3, which are independent. And so you, you can make a scalar by taking the dot product between the two, which will bring into the, uh, this angle as a factor. Right? So at this point, 
things do get different from the decay rate because when we make our polar angle substitution here um, and we go into spherical polar coordinates, we have a problem because we can't just say that what's in the integral is independent. So what we do is we, we're integrating here over P2 and we can split this now into rho squared d rho, right? So that's the radial uh, component. And then rather than say sine theta d theta d phi, what I'm going to say is d omega, where this is the solid angle, right? So it's really two differentials. It's d theta and, and, a, and a, a d phi, right? So this guy here is just our sine theta d theta d phi. But because in our in scattering interaction, this matrix element here may have a theta or phi dependence. Well, probably not a phi dependence, but it can at least have a theta dependence. Right? We can't just integrate out over this. Right? So this expression here, when we convert it into polar coordinates, we're going to end up with a uh, um, d rho d omega and we can't integrate it out. So what we're going to do is we're going to differentiate both sides with respect to solid angle. And so our cross section here, instead of being the total cross section sigma, becomes d sigma d omega. And then we're not integrating over omega. We're taking the you know, differential cross section, the cross section per unit solid angle. And so we're not integrating out the angular part anymore, All right? So instead, our cross section here, sigma, becomes d sigma d omega, and we only integrate out radially. We don't integrate out over the uh, uh, angular dependence, right? So what this means now is that the matrix element here can have an angular dependence because we're not integrating over the angular dependence. And if we want to get rid of the angular dependence to calculate the total cross section, that's something we have to do at the end when we've put in whatever dynamics is gov you know, governing this process, right? So it's a sort of a bit of a fiddle, but this is why differential cross sections are useful because it allows us to come up with a generic formula for this differential cross section um, without having to do the integration. And then we can, if, we, if it's useful to do the integration, we can do that at the end if you really want to know the total cross section or if you've got a detector that's, you know, because the angle that you integrate over now, because this thing depends on the, the scattering angle, um, the angle you integrate over is going to depend on your detector, right? It, it, it's going to have a detector dependence. So Again, despite the fact we've now got d sigma d omega, this expression here looks exactly the same, except for this guy, looks exactly the same as what we had before uh, for our um, uh, uh, decay rates. So the only difference here is m2 is replaced by m4, and m1 is replaced by this guy, right, because this was m1c uh, here. So again, we make exactly the same substitution. We call this m4 instead of m2. We get exactly the same result for the differential. We put it in here, and we end up with exactly the same expression we had here, only this now, instead of being m1c, is e1 plus e2 over c, right? But no difference other than that. And again, this is going to fix our value of u and also fixes the value of rho, right? Just as it did before. And the only difference here, though, is that this matrix element now has a fixed value of rho because we're into this fixing u fixes rho effectively, but it can still vary as a function of theta. Right? We haven't fixed it as a, uh, as a function of theta. So we still have an angular variation. And so I can integrate this out now, and we end up with this formula for the differential cross-section for a two-body scattering process. Right? So the difference here is that this guy now can depend on the um, angle between the incoming particles and the outgoing particles. Because, because we've got two particles colliding, we have, and two particles leaving, 
these guys do not have to occur uh, in, along the same line, and so we have an angular separation between the two, and the moment we've added an angular separation, this guy here can depend on this angular separation. Right? So our differential cross-section, you know, cross-section per unit solid angle here is given by this. This is the magnitude of the final particle momenta. This is the magnitude of the initial particle momenta. Obviously, because we've got two coming in, two going out, these guys are the same for both initial particles and both final particles. Um, this only applies in the center of mass, uh, of, course, of course, it's only in the center of mass frame two. Right? And we've got an angular dependence allowed because it's a differential cross-section. So I know I sort of whizzed through the second part a lot faster than the first part, but that's because it's the same. So are, are there any questions or things you didn't understand about that bit? Or are you all now shell-shocked because I went slowly in the first part and then zipped through the second part? It, it, I mean, it, you know, it, as long as you understood the first part with the decay rates, right? If you look through the notes and, and understand it, and there's some questions on the assignment which will make you look at parts, particularly of the second part, because I, I sort of intended to do this, go slowly through the first part, and then I put some assignment questions on, on parts of the derivation in the second part to sort of make you look at it so you'd have a, uh, uh, you know, so you can, because I can sit here and blather on, but you, you'll only really understand it when you try and figure it out yourself. Um, but as long as you understood how the decay rate worked, Understanding how this interaction, uh, uh, the scattering works, should be pretty straightforward. It's exactly the same method, it's just different physical conditions, right? Um, so have a look through it um, and, and make sure you do understand it. There's some questions on the, on the fourth assignment uh, that'll help with that. Um, but it is important that you sort of understand where these things come from because in the next lecture, we're going to start worrying about these uh, uh, matrix elements, right, and how to calculate those. So just to sort of uh, summarize a little bit uh, and talk about units, when we had decay rates, right, remember this was a probability per unit time, so we have units of per second, and for cross sections, we had units of area, but very small areas, so we measured things in, in barns, where one barn was the size of a uranium nucleus, or 10 to the minus 28 meters. Uh, meter squared. So this means that when we come to these matrix elements here, right, the dimensions of the matrix element uh, end up, if you work through those uh, equations, being mc to the power 4 minus the number of particles in the interaction. Right? So for a two-body decay, this matrix element it has units of momentum because you've got um, three particles, one initial, two final. So 4 minus 3, so you've got m times c. For a two-body uh, scattering or a three-body decay, then you have a matrix element that's dimensionless. So the dimensions of this guy actually depend on the type of interaction you're going to be calculating. They're not uh, a, a fixed thing, right? But overall, your cross-section has to be in area and your decay rate has to be uh, in per seconds. So we've introduced Fermi's golden rule, we've calculated the kinematics uh, for a two-body decay rate and the kinematics for a two-body scattering cross-section and shown that these are basically, in each case, kinematically constrained, or at least the differential cross-section is kinematically constrained and the total cross-section here is kinematic, or total decay rate is kinematically constrained. And next lecture, what we're going to do is we're going to introduce a toy theory with just three particles, each of which is a scalar particle, and we have one vertex, and we're going to draw some Feynman diagrams and then actually calculate, use those Feynman diagrams um, to calculate our, our matrix element M, and that'll keep things as simple as we can possibly make it, so you can see how to use these diagrams to calculate matrix elements, and then next week we will launch into relativistic uh, uh, quantum mechanics and actually do things like the Dirac equation where you can do a real theory like quantum electrodynamics and calculate real processes. But we'll sort of take it in, in steps because once we start dealing with real particles, they have spins and stuff like that that make everything messy and complicated. So we'll do the basics first, and then once you've got that, we'll, we'll add in the complications. Okay, so I'll stop there, and I'll see you all on uh, Thursday. <laughs>